Hi, everyone. My name is Raquel with FedMidnight.com, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. The topic of today's webcast is the changing role of Active Directory engineers in a cyber-resilient organization, sponsored by Semperis. A bit about our sponsor, Semperis is the pioneer of identity-driven cyber resilience for cross-cloud and hybrid environments. The company provides cyber preparedness, incident response, and disaster recovery solutions for enterprise directory services, the keys to the kingdom. Semperis has patented technology for Microsoft Active Directory, protects over 40 million identities from cyber attacks, data breaches, and operational errors. And now I'd like to share a few details about today's event. There will be a Q&A session towards the end of today's presentation, so please type any questions you may have in the Q&A box. Some parents have provided some resources which can be found on the right-hand side of your console, so please take a moment to check those out. And finally, the webcast is being recorded, so keep an eye out for a link in your email so you can re-watch the presentation or share it with a colleague. And now, I would like to introduce you to our two speakers today. First up, we'll be hearing from Gil Kirkpatrick, Chief Architect at Semperis, as well as Luke King, Solutions Architect also at Semperis. So we are in for a great event today, and with that, I'll pass the time over to Gil to get us started. Thank you very much, Raquel, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Gil Kirkpatrick, and I'm the Chief Architect at Semperis, where I'm responsible primarily for the design and the technology roadmap for our security products. I've been building products for Active Directory and other identity systems for a long, long time, and I've been a Microsoft MVP for the last 16 years. Um, my colleague here today is Luke Kane. Luke, you want to say hello? Yes. Hey, my name is Luke Kane, and I'm a solutions architect over at Semperis. Um, I started my IT career off in the U.S. military um, and actually transitioned to supporting a lot of various agencies within the intelligence community for some time. Uh, but I eventually shifted gears and came into the private sector about four years ago. Um, I initially was working for a large healthcare enterprise based out of Nashville, Tennessee. I still live there today. And now I'm, again, SA over at Cypress. Excellent. Thanks, Luke. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, life as an AD administrator and sort of where your career as an AD uh, administrator or architect is going to go. If you think, um, if you're an AD administrator today and you think that that's going to be your job description for a whole lot longer, I think you need to rethink your career plans. Uh, for sure, AD is everywhere. I, I think the last numbers I saw, it was still about 90% of uh, enterprises use Windows infrastructure and Active Directory as their primary way of authenticating. Um, and people aren't getting rid of their on-prem AD at, rapidly at all. There's lots of talk about it, but it's not really happening that much. Uh, and there's always work to do in AD. You're always consolidating domains or incorporating acquisitions or patching domain controllers whatever it might be, there's plenty of work to do. So it's not like AD itself is gonna go away. Um, but the truth is that Active Directory as a platform um, is done. You know, Microsoft's not gonna do anything to Active Directory. It's not gonna add any significant capabilities in the future. And most IT organizations aren't going to be investing a whole lot of time and money in their Active Directory either. Just It's just gonna be sort of normal care and feeding um, uh, as they go forward. It really, when you look at it, the last significant changes in AD were probably in, in 2012 R2, which is, I don't know what, eight years ago or something like that, seven years ago. Now, we could have a long, long discussion as to whether that's a, a good thing or not, but that's, that's basically how things are. But Active Directory is still critical, and in particular, it's critical to the security posture of, of an IT organization. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And, and Luke is going to walk us through how um, Active Directory and security fit together. Absolutely. So <clears throat> if you look at the uh, four pillars of identity, um, we're talking about authentication, authorization, um, and attributes, meaning explicitly attributes from the directory and an audit, 
you can see that they directly affect the three components of security. Um, the CIA triad, I'm sure you all will recognize that. So, and, and we'll, we'll kind of get a little bit into an example here. Um, for instance, to keep data confidential, you're gonna need to know who is accessing th that data, uh, the identity verification process or that authentication, therefore, can be directly mapped to the C within the CIA triad. Additionally, <clears throat> you'll also need to know if they should be able to access that data. This is the authorization pillar. Um, so, you know, let's let's talk about how most organizations determine authorization for a moment. Obviously, it can be accomplished directly through various group memberships, but it's also not uncommon to map those roles to specific attributes within the directory. So as, as an example, if the department attribute is populated with HR, then you're automatically provisioned as an administrator for the HR business app. So we need to, we get security controls that, that are focused on integrity. Um, those are designed to prevent the data from being modified or misused by an unauthorized party. Um, but believe it or not, most the most common cause of an application becoming unavailable isn't necessarily an outside attacker or some sort of bug in the software, but rather an administrator misconfiguring something. It's ultimately, as we know with the CIA triad, what we're talking about here is, is balance. So if identity is at the center of security and in most every organization, Active Directory is the core component of the identity ecosystem, we can conclude that AD is a core component of the organization's security. Even though you might have most of your critical business applications hosted in the cloud, you're most likely leveraging Active Directory to integrate those critical line of business apps and handle the authentication piece. It's really easy, I think, to get complacent and think that, you know, by by default, Active Directory is this highly redundant multi-master database that's just always on. But in real practice, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I'm sure, as an example, every AD administrator that I know that's listening into this webinar, they can think of a time where they've witnessed one of those critical business apps might be hard-coded to communicate with a specific domain controller for whatever reason, or DC in, in a specific data center. Um, then routine patching, like you'll talked about earlier, comes around and DC just fails to come back up. We're getting a, the, the blue screen of death, right? So we're struggling to get that to come back online. And now we've just caused uh, effectively a, a critical business app outage and everyone's access is affected. The point I'm driving at here is that regardless of what identity management platform the organization has chosen, Active Directory will inevitably be at the core. So it's vital that you as an AD administrator understand the role that you play in the overall organization's security posture. And that's what we're gonna be covering here in the rest of this slide today. But before we do, <laughs> let's pause for a quick moment and we'll give everyone a chance to answer our first poll question. Um, we'll take a few minutes here. Poll question number one, in your company, where does your AD team sit in the overall organizational structure? Identity and access management, IT infrastructure, operations, security, or somewhere else? Yeah, so we'll give you all a chance to uh, answer that and uh, we'll take a look at what the results look like before we continue on. Okay, so it looks Thank like you. for the 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 main responses that uh, the Active Directory team sits in IT infrastructure, which I've certainly seen plenty of that, and for others it's part of IAM or operations security and other, but really the bulk of it is an IT infrastructure. That's an interesting comment about the the role that AD has taken in in modern 
uh, enterprise IT, it's part of the plumbing, right? It's it's part of the stuff like DNS and, and the networking components that's just part of the background. And it's that has some bearing, I think, on, on how people look at AD or haven't been looking at AD as part of the security uh, question. Okay, so let's move ahead here. Um, so as, as an AD administrator or an architect, um, you know, how do you get more involved in security and what, what, what is the role of AD and what is the role of the AD administrator in the security story? And my goal here today is not to somehow turn you into a security, you know, an infosec professional or something like that, um, but really to lay out a, a, a kind of a roadmap where you can learn more about security and then bring that knowledge about security to your AD operations and then also raise the vis visibility of Active Directory operations to the security group inside your enterprise. So we've identified five things, and interestingly, both Luke and I have kind of gone through this, this transformation um, uh, to, to, to change your viewpoint or change, change your, your sort of professional orientation from um, being an AD person to being more of a security person. Um, first step is like with anything, uh, when you change roles professionally is to change your viewpoint. So it's change the way you look at problems and the way you look at, uh, the teams that you work with and the technologies that you work with. Next step is to learn more about the information security overall. Um, and we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Um, once you've learned something about security, you can now communicate with security professionals more professionally or more, more effectively, um, you need to expand your network. And that, that's both inside your organization and outside uh, your organization. Um, finally, to make yourself more valuable as, as a resource to the security effort in your enterprise, you need to become smarter about AD um, uh, so that you can sort of become the go-to person for, for Active Directory issues as they relate to security. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can take this new knowledge about security and Active Directory and apply that to the, the projects that you're working on. So first, let's, uh, let's start off with um, how you change your viewpoint. Um, so these are, are uh, sort of attitudes or viewpoints that I've seen in lots of security professionals. And, and the first thing you need to do to effectively adopt the security mindset or to have the security enlightenment is to, is to have some of these realizations. The first one is um, to realize exactly how porous the network perimeter actually is. The, the idea that there's the uh, corporate network that's protected from the rest of the world by, by firewalls and such really is, um, is a bogus idea at this point. When you have an unmanaged client connect up to the corporate network through a VPN or you have users who are accessing cloud resources or accessing internal resources from outside the organization, you're essentially opening up um, the internal corporate network to whatever malware um, that those PCs might have. Um, so you really have to lose this idea that that the internal network is somehow completely separated from the rest of the world. And if you look at the, the different kinds of zero-day vulnerabilities that have been uncovered in, in firewalls and VPNs in the last six months or so, you can see that the network perimeter is just not much of a perimeter at all. And that's, in fact, where the whole... I'm sorry, go ahead, Luke. I would say there's been a lot. You're right. I've seen a lot more of those remote code exploits coming through for zero days on the network. Yeah. Yeah, it's really crazy. And, and it's uh, that's sort of the worst place in the world to have a vulnerability, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's really where the idea of zero trust comes from. Um, you know, this idea that the corporate network boundary really doesn't provide any significant security guarantees. Um, so you really have to rely on the identity systems to provide authentication and authorization uh, for application access. Um, so that's the first realization you need to have. The second one is, is that your organization is under constant attack. And, and this is not hard to believe. 
uh, if you look at some of the recent statistics. Um, on average, this is something I just dug up a couple of days ago. On average, an organization is hit with a ransomware attack every 11 seconds. And that's just kind of mind boggling when you think the, of the number of IT organizations that there are. And each of those attacks on average costs more than $100,000, either in ransom or recovery costs. And across the industry, it costs ransomware. This is not just any kind of malware attack. It's, it's specifically ransomware. Uh, costs more than $75 billion a year. Um, so the second realization you need to have is, yes, you're under constant attack. It's, it's not a myth. The third realization, um, and this is another attitude that I've seen in every security professional, um, is that we've already been compromised. Now, it might not be precisely true, um, but it's, I think, an effective viewpoint to have. Um, because when, when a threat actor um, succeeds in getting a foothold on, on one of your PCs, what they typically do is will uh, they'll install a... Um, a beacon which phones home occasionally and basically uh, asks the attacker, what kind of malware should I download so that they can start doing uh, reconnaissance and lateral movement uh, and create back doors. Um, but that initial um, compromise um, will sit there for months. I, th I think the last time I remember looking at it is that, that attacks usually go undetected for something like six months, uh, which is kind of scary. So, so this idea that um, you've already been compromised makes lots of sense because just because you haven't seen the attack doesn't mean that the malware isn't already there. Talking about that assume breach mentality, right? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, that's... Um, like I said, every security professional I've talked to has that viewpoint that they've already been compromised and they're just working with compromised computers all the time. That's that's sort of the attitude that they take. Yeah. Um, next realization is that identity really is the foundation of security. Now we talked about this with the whole zero trust mindset, um, but it bears re repeating. Um, you can't have any kind of security without a functioning identity system. Um, the identity uh, infrastructure really is the control plane that determines who can access what resource and under what circumstances. Um, and for most organizations, as Luke said, Active Directory is the is the core of the identity infrastructure. So therefore, uh, Active Directory is is a core component of your overall security posture, uh, which means that you, as an Active Directory administrator or architect, um, are in, in fact insecurity. And when you have those realizations, you, you, you start thinking of your AD admin job a little bit differently. It's not just, you know, adding people to groups or fixing up GPOs or, or um, promoting do, new domain controllers. Uh, what you do as an Active Directory admin really is a core component of your organization's security picture. picture. So once you once you've sort of had that enlightenment that you are part of security, you can you can move forward, um, and then you need to start learning and understanding new things, especially around with the security space. You can't just focus on sort of the day to day tactical AD functions. Yep, good point. <clears throat> Brings us to this this concept of understanding the big picture, right? Um, obviously, we we kind of understand that. Although AD operations has got a very specific role to play within the organization, um, it, it's critical that you understand all the other pieces of the puzzle in order to accomplish the mission. Um, it's easy, I mean, I know I've done it myself, it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day the -day tasks and, and projects you're working on, like meeting regulatory compliance re requirements, right? Whether that's PCI DSS or uh, HIPAA if you're in healthcare, um, or preparing for an upcoming audit, um, and then you, in turn, forget about what's ultimately driving the business. Um, but you know, this is a common, I think, mishap with with all sectors of business. It it's easy to become so hyper focused and develop a sort of tunnel vision on what you're supposed to be focused on. Um, I'll give you an example. I know 
for myself in a previous life as an AD ops engineer um, over at a large healthcare enterprise. Uh, it was our team that got tasked with a, a large project to identify all the applications that were still leveraging legacy authentication protocols. So NTLM v1, v2, Landman. And we'd obviously have to work with both the security team as well as the application owners to start effectively turning off these legacy authentication methods, both internally and externally. Um, I still can recall <laughs> early on in that process, uh, I was sitting in, in one of the meetings with the, uh, the lead security architect um, and as well as a senior colleague of mine. And I remember saying, you know, we could easily just push out a group policy, forcing all clients to utilize NTL MV5 and that'll solve this problem rather quickly. <laughs> um, Granted, I was being a bit facetious in the moment, um, but we were so overwhelmed looking back on that team with other projects at that time. You know, I was truly only focused on our area of re responsibility. I wasn't really focused on the bigger picture and how taking my approach, right, just pushing out this GPO that's going to force everybody to NTL MV5 uh, would ultimately affect not just all the applications, but all the users needing to access them as well. So, you know, looking back now, uh, over the next several months, I slowly began to adjust my perspective um, as we worked with the, actually it was the Splunk at the time we leveraged, that was our SIM product. So we worked with the SIM team to identify all the servers and clients that were still allowing NTLM v1 and v2 requests. And then we coordinated and we worked with the application owners for those systems to upgrade and then test them uh, in an OU structure that we had developed within the AD architecture, the hierarchy, where we had linked various GPO settings, forcing from NTLM v1 disabled to v2, so on and so forth. And it would take, you know, sometimes several weeks, uh, some some of the bigger applications months to get them up to speed. Um, it was a long and grueling process. Um, again, some some apps were a little bit faster to get upgraded, but the end goal we had that was pushed down from the security team, which was kind of driving the overarching strategy here, um, was to get at least 95 or greater percent up to at least, I think it was NTLM v3, v4, which is gonna improve the overall security posture pretty significantly. Um, and we effectively did do that. I think it was a, a little over a year it took to get to that point, but it was very much a team effort and we couldn't have accomplished it without collaborating together and applying this, this strategy of the security team and the tactics of those application owners and the AD team. Um, I've got a nice little quote here that, that kind of relates the strategy and, and tactics from Sun Tzu, uh, just seemed to, to go well with the topic of discussion we've got here, which brings yeah, us. Been... Oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. No, 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 no was, my bad. I was gonna say, um... Coming from the perspective of uh, product development, so at Semperis, we, we build products for uh, security and cyber resilience with a, an identity focus, and, and obviously we spend a lot of time working with Active Directory, and I've seen more and more just from my side of the fence that Active Directory teams are being driven much more by security re requirements, especially with respect to um, outside malware and ransomware attacks. Um, there, there seems to be a lot more, um, what's the right word? It, basically a lot more initiative being driven from the security side of the house on right. the active directory team to deal more effectively with things like ransomware and, and providing tighter controls on application access. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Looking back, even for myself, you know, and a lot of the projects that we were driven. I mean, I gave that one example there, but it, it was driven through the the security mindset. Um, security team was the one implementing that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, right. we've got the, what the next. Oh, uh, yep. we so next we'll do the next slide. next poll slide here. Um, so we've got how strong is the interaction between your AD team and the security organization? Uh, we got a few options here. Looks like we've got a comment from someone saying we're we're missing an option mission missing from this question. <laughs> we've we've got we never hear from them. We meet when they have something they want us to do. 
We meet regularly, but infrequently, and we're tied at the hip. So I'm curious, Jorge, which... Oh, that's George. Hello, George. Um... So we'll give this a minute here to allow everybody to respond in. Look at this. Okay, you want to switch over to the yeah. Let's see how results. the results are let's going here. Why is it going back? Here, I'll, I'll push it. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we never hear from them. Four <laughs> percent. That's that's actually good news. Um, but the the most popular answer uh, at forty percent is we're tied at the hip. That's actually really, really good and, and reflects what I've seen in our customer base as well, that, that the Active Directory team is being driven more and more by um, the security team. Yeah. Okay, so um, another different viewpoint that security people have I think that that's quite different from AD administrators um, is, is, is a sort of profound distrust of people. And I don't mean this in a bad way, although there are a lot of security guys who are kind of this, do have this sort of antisocial mindset. Um, but to a security professional, everyone is either evil, incompetent, or, or in the best case, fallible. Um, so evil people is... That's pretty obvious. You know, someone who's intentionally trying to harm the organization either by stealing data or um, trying to extract some ransom, or uh, you might have a, a you know disgruntled administrator who just wants to uh, set fire to everything after they leave. Um, those kind of people are easy to understand. That's that's never a source of confusion. Um, but one of the things that security people also understand is that there, there's a large percentage of people in IT and, and who are using IT systems who are just kind of incompetent. And it's, you know, it's either because they don't fully understand what they're doing or they're maybe not as diligent in their work as they should be. Um, but, you know, everybody's had the story of, you know, you're, you're making some changes to Active Directory, like you want to deploy a new set of group policies, and and uh, the your process is to test those group policies in a test for us first, and make sure that the applications work properly. And and the guy who's responsible for it, you know, he he maybe deploys the GPOs in the test environment, but he doesn't bother to run the applications, and then the GPOs get. Uh, uh, published to the production environment, the applications crash, and it's it's all bad. the The point is that a lot of people are just not that good and not that diligent at the work that they do. And then the third category um, really applies to everybody else. Uh, everybody makes mistakes. Uh, everybody can um, you know skip over a step or misread a, a result. And the result of that is potentially that you have severely affected your organization's security posture. Um, so all of, the, all of the information security professionals that I know have this view of people that they're evil, either evil, incompetent, or fallible. And it's something that you need to keep in mind when you're building your processes and systems uh, to protect the organization from, from bad guys. You have to understand that you can't rely on just a person doing the right thing all the time. Um, so it requires that you yourself take great care and great diligence in your work to make sure that you take into account the fact that people are either evil, incompetent, or fallible. It's funny, you, you gave that example there with the fallible, and I was thinking of a story. Um, <laughs> Just a few years back, uh, yeah. we had somebody that would uh, really go through and and run this this script for helping uh, with provisioning aspect. Uh, 
usually on a Friday afternoon, Friday evening after everybody's gone for the day. And uh, I think he had fat fingered something and it, it ran against thousands of users and it brought down the, in, the entire provisioning application. <laughs> um, got a call, but, and, and this is one of the sharpest people that frankly I've, I've ever worked with, right? But even even he missed something in there. I think it, I, I'm trying to recall the specifics of it, but I wanna say there was, it was something very, very minuscule as well, like using a, a back tick in lieu of an apostrophe when in coding into the, the script that he had in there. And it, it just, it ripped all these thousands of users access out. Yeah. Yeah. Valuable, so it's, definitely. yeah it's, re it's really important when, when you're designing processes and systems um, that um, you understand that people will make mistakes and, and you want to right. build your systems in a way that if someone makes a mistake, it's not going to, either you, you somehow prevent the mistake or you make sure that if they do make a mistake, that it's not going to compromise the entire enterprise. You, you, you don't want to make those mistakes that, that might kill you. You know, those are the, those are the worst ones. Yeah. And that sort of relates to um, the next uh, sort of mindset change that you need to have as an AD person moving more into security. Uh, and that's developing this this level of diligence. Um, um, just to, is, is just being being very aware of the effects that you as an AD administrator can have on your overall company's security posture um, will help you understand that you need to be very careful in the way you approach your work. So, so as an example, uh, one of our customers is a is a big retailer, um, and they have. Uh, something like 450 domain controllers all around the world. And when they were deploying one of our products, which actually um, has an agent that runs on each of those domain controllers, um, some weekend they just decided to go ahead and deploy it. Um, we, we actually weren't aware of it at the time. And the software had a problem on two of the domain controllers, so two out of the 450. And... I, we, they got in touch with us on Monday and, and we diagnosed it. And it turns out that those two domain controllers had a couple of additional certificates installed in the certificate store that the other, other ones didn't. And they were really dismayed at the fact that they had two domain controllers that were configured differently from the other domain controllers in the environment. They were just horrified at that, that somehow those two were different. They couldn't figure out why. And, and uh, it was one of those things they, it was just a big surprise to them, big shock. And for me, I was astounded that they had 448 domain controllers that were all configured the same. Um, but it, it, it's just, um, it, it just an example of the care uh, and diligence that they had in maintaining their domain controllers to all be configured exactly the same with respect to those certificates. Um, so that's that's one of those mindset changes you, you need to have uh, if you want to become a valuable contributor to your organization's security efforts, is that what you do actually has a significant effect on your overall company's security. So let's say, you know, we've, we've talked about different ways, different viewpoint changes and different attitude changes that you need to have as you're becoming more of a security professional. Uh, Luke's gonna walk us through some of the things you can do to make yourself smarter about security and Active Directory itself. Yes, absolutely. Let's make sure this slide comes here. So now that we've started shifting our security viewpoint, as Gil was alluding to, <clears throat> you've got to start to ramp up your security intelligence and get smart about how AD relates to your organization's overall security posture. Um, you don't need to necessarily become a security engineer, but you need to be able to think like one. And honestly, there's a lot of useful resources out there to help you on this front. Um, I'll make reference to a few of them here uh, while we're, we're chatting, but we've also got several slides at the end of this presentation uh, where we've listed many of these out for you. Um, if you signed up for the webinar, then you should have access to those slides to bookmark and make reference to them later. I know I have a lot of these bookmarks, so I can carry them over. Um, but I'll start with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which 
I'm sure your red and blue teams are going to be deeply familiar with. So the, the MITRE ATT&CK framework is a comprehensive matrix of tactics and techniques which are used to essentially classify the various types of attacks into categories and subcategories, as well as identify which operating system platforms can be affected by each particular attack. Uh, this framework that we're talking about here is then used by organizations to aid in assessing their overall risk and gauging an environment's level of visibility against targeted attacks. So without digging too deep into this here, I mean, you should at least be familiar with the 14 tactics and have an understanding of how some of those map to the mitigations that you as an AD administrator are going to be enforcing on a daily task-oriented approach. Um, another good resource is going to be the MITRE CVE, which compiles a public list of all the common vulnerabilities and exposures, but it's your responsibility to keep current on trends and ensure that you're appropriately prioritizing and addressing all of these vulnerabilities. Um, there's also a ton of CBTs out there on various platforms to help broaden your knowledge base. Personally, I've always been a heavy user of Pluralsight. It's just real easy to navigate and they also break things down by category very easily. And they've got this new function that came in, it was probably just a couple of years ago called Skill IQ. Uh, where you can take tests, so it's easy to take a quick test, gauge your level of proficiency, identify your weaknesses, and then what I'll do is I'll set aside on my calendar, you know, an hour or two hours each week. Usually, I I pick Fridays, which are typically lighter for me. I'll run through some of the training on my own, and then I'll retake the skill IQ test once I've completed all the training. The only downside to Pluralsight is there's usually a cost associated with with it, but personally, I believe it's worth the investment. Um, there, there's other platforms out there that have free training, such as cybrary.it uh, and a cloudguru.com. And again, we've got references at the end here to, to give out list dozens more. But I'd also suggest bookmarking the R sysadmin subreddit. It's funny, I mentioned this on a call actually with a, a customer a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, he hadn't heard of it, but I caught wind of it. Uh, I, I caught wind of the, the Microsoft Teams ad outage. I don't know if you remember, Gil, a couple weeks ago. Microsoft Teams had an outage. Now. Yes, so I actually was looking in the background. I happened to be on the Arsys admin subreddit blogs, looking, reading something, and I saw someone posted indicating, hey, global Teams outage affected everybody. So I didn't really bother to even play and figure it out. Um, let's move on here. So when we're talking about tools, there there's several big ones I think you should be familiar with as an AD administrator, Bloodhound, uh, is, is a big one, obviously, that uses graph theory to reveal the hidden and often unintended relationships within an Active Directory environment. It can be used to identify various different attack paths, which encompass everything from access control lists, users, groups, trust relationships, and unique objects in AD. Um, and actually, Bloodhound can be used by both your red and blue teams. Mimikatz is another source uh, it's actually, actually an open source tool that dumps passwords from memory, as well as hashes, pins, Kerberos tickets. Mimikatz enables other useful tactics, such as pass the hash, pass a ticket, or building Kerberos golden tickets, <clears throat> and is touted as, quote, the world's most dangerous password stealing platform. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that one off from the other night. And, and it is true. You know, there was one we were talking about the other day, Gil, that you mentioned to me, actually, uh, PowerShell Empire. It was the first I heard of it. I started to read up a little bit, but I hadn't I hadn't actually played with it myself. Can you give us an idea of the PowerShell Empire yeah, utility, so, that so, tool? And yeah, so PowerShell Empire is actually a collection of PowerShell tools, um, and, 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 and it incorporates a lot of what Mimikatz can do. In fact, I th it may even run Mimikatz under the covers. Um, it's another open source project. I, I think it's not being developed anymore. Uh, I, it started in uh, 2016, 2017, something like that, um, as, a, as a collection of sort of red teaming tools. Um, it has been used in lots of different kinds of malicious attacks. One of the amazing things that it does is that, um, you know, so you, you, can, you can download it if you get 
access to a compromised PC, you can download it onto the, that PC. It'll set up a beacon, and then uh, it can actually download PowerShell scripts and run them without invoking PowerShell EXE. Oh, wow. Uh, and without writing anything to disk. So it does everything in memory um, in a, a process that it's hijacked uh, on, the, on that PC. So if, if you think, well, I'll just audit all PowerShell activity on my domain controllers or something. In fact, this is something a customer asked us about a while ago. Yeah, you can do that, but it really doesn't help against these kinds of attacks because what what the what PowerShell Empire and other tools do is they'll inject uh, the PowerShell scripts into memory, into some processes memory, um, and then reference the DLLs that, that actually implement PowerShell, not PowerShell EXE, not the command line part of it, and just start executing the PowerShell commands. So you can write all your reconnaissance software, your lateral movement software in something really convenient like PowerShell and I'm execute it in a way that's essentially transparent. It's um, huh. it's pretty remarkable, actually. I might have to play with that one, even though. There's, uh, there's another one I pulled down as well. It's also free, a Ping Castle. I actually had heard of that a few weeks back. Several customers had run through it. It's a free, lightweight, Windows-based utility. It's used to audit the risk level of your AD infrastructure and then a check for a few vulnerability practices as well. And then Purple Knight is another big one. It was just recently released by Semperis, and it contains, right now, I think we're up to about 60 different indicators, which conduct an overall security assessment of an AD enterprise. It'll spit out a health score at the end, and then we kind of break that down into various categories, which are mapped directly over to that uh, MITRE attack framework we talked about earlier. Um, I've actually been running through several of these in customers' production environments the last few weeks, and it's great for identifying some of the more common AD misconfigurations that haven't yet been locked down, such as service principal names on privilege accounts. Um, what I'm finding out, though, is you know a lot of the, the AD ops folks are aren't as familiar and, and you know, having to read up on, well, okay, ISPNs on privilege accounts, what is the attack vector that, that this is leveraged for this, right? So those would be vulnerable to offline brute forcing and dictionary attacks, as well as great targets for curb roasting. Um, another one we look for in Purple Knight is unconstrained curb roast delegation, which can be leveraged for a DC sync attack. Um, and there's a ton of other scenarios. There's a lot to learn in the security space, but again, as we said earlier, you don't have to become a security specialist. The goal here is to expand your knowledge of the security landscape so that you can then contribute your AD expertise to the security effort effectively. It's vital to stay current on the existing threat landscape as it's always evolving, and we're seeing more zero-day attacks being leveraged in the real world. In fact, during COVID, we've been seeing an extremely high increase in those ransomware and the wiper attacks that, Gil, you mentioned earlier at the beginning of this webinar, right? I think you were saying every 11 seconds, right? But Mind boggling. The, do this right here. So the next step in this evolution is to expand your professional network. Kind of highlighted to it earlier, but I, I've been fortunate enough to work on several tasks and projects over the years with folks from the Security Operations Center, Incident Response Team, Audit and Compliancy, and others. Uh, referring back to that story I mentioned earlier about the project to phase out legacy authentication protocols, we had to work extensively with the security team, or more specifically, the folks responsible for integrating our SIM platform, as that was how we were able to determine which systems were actively utilizing older NTLM versions for authentication. And as I was working on this presentation, so I also began to realize the importance of the second bullet on here, finding a mentor. If you want to find a good mentor, um, one of the things I would suggest is volunteering for those tasks and projects where you're going to get the opportunity to work directly with these folks. I, honestly, I've done this several times in my career, um, and it's worked out quite well for me. Um, you'll also start building those important and lasting relationships to expand and improve what I like to call your, your network of competency. So um, you can 
expand your professional network inside your organization, you know, like working with a, a security team or finding a, a, a mentor who can sort of help you along personally. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of networking you can do outside the organization. Um, there are a bunch of uh, professional infosec uh, organizations that you can participate in. So when I when I was living in Australia, uh, I joined ISACA, which is the Information Systems Audit and Control Association. Um, that was my first, um, you know, first exposure to infosec as, as a profession rather than uh, identity um, for me, and. They're more focused, uh, ISAC is more focused on sort of the governance and management and organizational management of security overall. But the group in Sydney anyway, had a wide range of skills and interests. They, um, you know, they met monthly and, and they had technical presentations and, and more sort of abstract presentations about organizational and uh, compliance issues. But everybody there was super helpful. And, and you know, when I told them I was building identity products and wanted to understand better how they fit into the the governance story they were all super helpful uh, in helping me understand that and that helped drive our product development um, another one is isc squared i i've not really dealt with isc squared but they are responsible for the cissp certification program which is a really well regarded uh, security infosec security certification. And they have a lot of uh, training material available on their website. I think the courses cost money um, uh, for in a lot of cases. But you'll see lots of sources. If you just Google CISSP, you'll probably find a dozen uh, companies that are providing uh, certification training. And, and ISC Squared has a bunch of material on their website that you can you can look at as well. Uh, then I have to mention the Hybrid Identity Profe uh, Protection Conference, which is what we run at, at Sempras. So before COVID, we we were doing uh, sort of regional conferences, which I think we probably did ten of them uh, overall. Uh, but you know we did them in places like uh, Chicago and Detroit and Atlanta and Dallas and so forth. And we'd usually have fifty to one hundred people show up at those, and we'd have four or five technical sessions. And then a lot of networking time, um, and that was a great place for people who lived in the same area uh, to get together, find out what they were up to, uh, learn something from the presenters, but then also learn from each other because they, they were there in the same uh, same room. Um, and we also run a, or we will be running an annual conference. Um, typically, it's been in New York, uh, which goes for two or three days, and and it's sort of modeled after the, the core principles of the Directory Experts Conference, which is to provide uh, very deep technical level sessions with no uh, marketing nonsense. Um, so that's another place that you can go to expand your professional network and also learn more about um, both Active Directory and Azure Active Directory and identity security in general. And then another organization that, that I've joined here in the U.S. is ISSA. And so unlike ISACA, they're, they're much more technical, technically focused. The chapter here in Boise, I think, has a couple hundred people. Um, and the monthly meetings, usually 40 or 50 people will show up. And they're uh, all tech, very technical people focused either on Windows or Linux or red teaming. Uh, or the network infrastructure, something like that. And, and the usual deal is there'll be one or two presentations. It might be a vendor presentation or a, a member presentation, and then um, networking. And um, they also run a, an annual conference, which I haven't been to yet. Um, so th that just gives you an idea that there are lots of professional organizations that you can uh, join and participate in, even though you're not a you know, looking to become a uh, full-time uh, infosec professional, uh, it's a great it's a great way to get up the learning curve um, and uh, and and find like-minded professionals. So that brings us to the um, last polling slide, um, which is 
There you go. Um, which is which professional organization do you associate with? Um, ISACA, ISSA, ISC squared, uh, the HIP conference, or or any others. Uh, so we'll take a very short break here and let you start answering those. Okay, so we've got uh, INC squared is the big one. Yeah, is the major one, and, and I imagine people who either have their CISSP or are pursuing it yeah. would that would be a lot of them, and they have other certifications too. It, um, I think CISSP is the is the main heavy one. hitter. It is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are a lot of others. That's interesting. I'd like to find out more about those. So if if you have a chance to. Uh, poke at the chat window and just let us know what are some of the other professional InfoSec organizations that you associate with. I'd be really interested in uh, hearing about that. Right. Okay, so um, the um, next step in your journey to become a more valuable security professional here is is to add to your Active Directory expertise. And this might not be obvious, but, but let me explain what I mean here. So first, you, you've, if you've gone through this process and, and you've learned more about uh, IT security and you've adopted this InfoSec-oriented viewpoint, you'll start looking at Active Directory differently. As a, It's not just a directory that you have users and groups and group policies and things like that. It actually control controls access to things and substantially affects your organization's security posture. So you 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 can sort of go back and look at what you already know about AD and just see it in a new perspective uh, from a security perspective. Um, and and that that's sort of one level of new AD expertise that you can get. The other one is to understand in more detail how things in Active Directory really work. So everybody that I, every Active Directory professional I talk to has this sort of vague understanding of Kerberos. You know, they know that you you authenticate and you get a, a, a TGT and then you get a service ticket and, and that's what the service uses to let you get in. Um, but that's often, that's sort of the level of detail that people will understand Kerberos at. But it, when you look at how Kerberos uh, tools like Mimikatz can can, cur uh, can compromise Kerberos and hijack those tickets, then you really start getting an understanding of how Kerberos really and single sign-on in general really works. And same thing when you start going to cloud applications like, say, Azure Active Directory, you start understanding what OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 really do when you start seeing how malware tries to, to uh, subvert them. Another area that you could really learn more about is, is replication. It's an area where AD administrators sort of generally have an idea of, of what it does. But when you see a tool uh, like DC Shadow, which is a component of Mimikatz, um, how it can, can hijack the replication process to inject changes in your AD uh, without showing up in any domain controller logs because those changes never occurred on a domain controller. They were just sort of appeared in the replication stream. When you, when you understand how that happens, then you start really understanding how replication works. So when, when you start looking at Active Directory from a security point of view and you look at the malware that's used to um, for reconnaissance or lateral movement, you, you really do get smarter about AD. The other thing about getting smarter about AD that's important is that it makes you a more valuable resource to your security team. Um, so this, this can put you in the position of being the go-to AD person. So when security has some issue they need to deal with in Active Directory, um, being plugged into the InfoSec team and also being known as the AD person who just knows how everything works, 
that is a really great place to be because that plugs you into all all of the infosec activity that relates to active directory so how do you become smarter about ad it's it's interesting ad is is very mature now and there seems to be a lot less professional education going on around ad that than there used to be certainly uh, on the other hand microsoft's really improved their ad documentation um, you know, when, a, when Active Directory shipped, there was essentially none. Um, and nowadays, you can find most of what you need on in, in the Microsoft documentation set online. Uh, HipConf, obviously, is a good place to learn about uh, the innards of AD and how that relates to security. And, and Microsoft continues to run their own conferences like Ignite. Uh, TechNet forum, forums can be kind of hit or miss. Sometimes you get someone who's really smart. Sometimes you get people who really just don't know what they're talking about. Um, so th those are the kinds of places you can go to, to really add to your Active Directory expertise. And, and um, now I'll just turn it back over to Luke to talk a little bit about how you take that new knowledge of security and Active Directory and apply that to the projects that you're working on. Absolutely, yeah. So now we're, we're, take, we're, we're talking about taking all your knowledge, those resources, that new perspective we talked about earlier um, and putting that into practice and then applying it into the real world. So th this means sitting down and coming up with a plan to tackle the existing problems that you have within your environment. Uh, remember, we have to balance that strategic yet tactical approach that we talked about earlier. Um, but a few examples might be cleaning up of old group policy objects that aren't being used or aren't linked we can start implementing admin tiering within your AD hierarchical structure if you're not already doing so. This is a simple, very simple yet effective way to get your privilege counts and systems under stricter, tighter security controls. Um, yet it's something that very few companies have implemented successfully. Um, working on simplifying the provisioning and deprovisioning process. As a general rule, <clears throat> when evaluating problems and solutions to tackle first. I would keep it simple and strive for those which have the highest return on investment, ROI, on improving your organization's overall security posture. Um, obviously, keep the bigger picture in mind. We talked about that earlier. And then having that strategic plan to tackle these projects and ensure you're communicating clearly and concisely with all the relevant and affected parties. Yep, and I'd like to add to that that, again, this is a, a viewpoint that I've seen in Active Directory professionals who have become very involved in, in the security story. Um, and it reminds me of a quote from Colin Chapman, who is the founder of Lotus Cars, and he was a brilliant automotive engineer and, and uh, really was the basis of Lotus's success in Formula One early on. Um, and my favorite quote from him is, simplify, then add lightness. Um, all of his cars were very focused on being simple, light, and therefore uh, extremely uh, nimble handling and great acceleration and braking. Um, that principle really applies to IT systems as well. Simpler systems are easier to make secure and simpler systems are easier to keep secure. And if they happen to get compromised, they're easier to understand and, and patch up. So when, you, when you're working on your AD-related projects, keep, out, keep an eye out for ways you can simplify the whole thing. So let's say you've got this five-step process for importing new users and groups from the HR system. Look to see how you can make that into a one-step process that doesn't require lots of manual inter intervention. Um, you know, instead of massaging a bunch of entries in a, in a spreadsheet, write a PowerShell script to do it. Or if... Um, when you when you say provision a new user for for some application that isn't AD integrated, and that requires a bunch of manual steps, see how you can make that application use LDAP authentication or federated SSO or something like that. But anytime you can simplify your your Active Directory environment and the things that are tying into Active Directory um, is better from a management standpoint an operation standpoint and, and from a security standpoint, because it's easier to, to make secure and keep secure. All right. Um, 
So I think we're pretty much getting to the end here. We've got a few questions to go through. So let me just really quickly wrap up what we've covered and then we'll go to the questions. Um, we talked about how you can change your viewpoint um, as an active directory administrator becoming more involved in security. Uh, we looked at different ways you can learn about InfoSec in general um, so that you can understand what the security professionals are working with, speak the lingo and communicate more, more effectively. Uh, we looked at ways to expand your professional network both inside the organization with your InfoSec team or finding a mentor uh, and outside the organization with the various InfoSec um, uh, associations that are available. Uh, we talked a little bit about increasing your AD expertise to make yourself more valuable to the security program in general. Um, and then we talked about ways you can take that new knowledge and apply it to the projects that you're working on already. So I think, Luke, have, I, have we sort of summarized everything? Yes, we have. I think you've gotten through, done the recap. We got the slides at the end that we'll push out to everybody. But there was one question that came in a little bit earlier, kind of halfway through here from Robert Sullivan, I wanted to bring up. So Robert asks, <clears throat> we have issues from time to time with users getting locked out frequently, but cannot determine root cause. We're finding it harder and harder to determine cause since adding O365 and Azure to our environment. What is, here's his question, what is a good, what is a sound process to determine these lockouts and how to tell if these are user and or user computer issues or a malicious attack? So I thought this was a great question. I actually ran into a similar symptom a few weeks back with one of our customers and they have this, uh, oh my goodness, smart lockout, hang on, smart account lockout with Azure. Let's see what they call this here. Yes, Azure AD password protection is smart lockout. And I'll, t I'll put, put that link. This is a good way to, to put it in here. But what we found out with the example that I'm referring to, Robert, is we noticed that all of the lockouts, they were getting heavily hit. All these users were getting locked out. Uh, I mean, they were having, it was, we're talking about 150, 175,000 users uh, in total within their AD. And they were getting about 14,000 lockouts a day tracking them down. I think they were leveraging their SIM integration. They noticed that the vast majority of those were coming from ADFS. Um, Gil, you probably already know what I'm driving at here. Yeah. <laughs> they had some legacy endpoints that were still enabled in ADFS uh, for O365, excuse me, O365 for 20, I think it was 2013 and older. So, you know, our recommendation was, first of all, do you have any clients that are even using these legacy endpoints? Um, they, they reached out to O365 team hadn't got an answer back, but that was kind of the biggest route, right? If you're getting password spray attacks and those accounts are getting locked out that frequently, I, I just think that should be that should be a bigger priority. If you're getting a password spray against that percentage of users, you put the doesn't look like I can put the link in. If you go to Google, Robert, you should be able to pull that down. I think because I answered it here, it's not going to let me put a new answer. Send. Yes, there we go. Okay, All so right. um, we've got a couple of other questions here. I'll take one. I think we can take maybe one more here because we're already a couple minutes over. Yeah. Uh, it says if I'm uh, if I'm an AD architect or admin who's never been invited to any discussions with a security team and I'm concerned about possible vulnerabilities and identity controls, what's the best way to bring the situation to light without offending or? <laughs> Well, I guess I, I, I would not worry about offending people or appearing power hungry. I mean, generally speaking, if if that's not where you're coming from, people aren't going to react that that way. Um, you know, if you make it clear that that the that that what you're trying to achieve is is better a better security posture, I, it's unusual for people to get that offended about about it. And I guess the, the question might be, if, if these are identity controls um, specifically, you probably want to go to the IAM team and, and say, um, look, you know, here's, here's something that I've noticed. That it looks like we could provision access to applications that, that are incorrect. Um, you know, here's maybe a way to, to fix that process. Um, so I, for me, the direct approach makes the most sense. Um, 
and and just sort of lay out what you think the issue is and how it might be improved. Now, if it's if it's a more infosec kind of thing and not specific specifically the identity team, if you have a, uh, a separate identity team, I guess go to the the people in the infosec group who have direct exposure to AD and and just bring up your issue there. Um, I, I you know you need the personal skills to to not come across as offensive or or, or blaming. Uh, and I think if you if you use those skills, you you won't have any trouble without offending people. Um, okay, let's see. Um, oh, from Matthew, I think it's more common. I think this goes back to the training thing. It's more common that many organizations do not want to spend money to properly train their people and or over or they overburden their staff with unrealistic workloads. It's unfair to yeah. suggest it's generally the fault of the IT employee. Totally agree. I mean, it's and I'm not trying to suggest that it's it's a fault of anybody's here. I'm I'm just looking at this as, um, you know, as professionals, you know, we have a responsibility, I think, to educate ourselves and to make ourselves more valuable. It's not it's not just um, wait for my organization to to make me better somehow. Um, you know, it's a it's a profession. It is a profession, and I think some of that responsibility lies with the individual to just make themselves smarter. Um, but you're also right. A lot of IT orgs either don't invest any of that kind of uh, effort in their employees, and you know, unfair workloads. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know what you can do really do about that. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, you know, Luke, you've you've certainly seen this sort of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I thought this. I saw that earlier. That response. I thought, you know, I've I've run into that myself. Where it's some organizations they just haven't made that a priority to say, hey, we've got some funds here to to send you to this conference. Um, obviously, some of the big ones, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft's conferences. Now those are all virtual. So, you know, that that was kind of nice this year to be able to to do those virtually. Um, yep. Yeah. Got okay. a couple more. Looks like we had. Good, good results back. Great job moving here toward better securing my environment. Understanding how we'll get some good feedback here from some of the participants. So yeah, I think I think we have emails that we can respond to the rest of these with because um, okay. we're we are a little over time here. So I think let's yeah. uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Um, when you get access to the slides, there are a bunch of resources at the end. So we've listed you know places for. Uh, Think people and organizations you can follow on social media to learn more about InfoSec, uh, lots of different security tools, and uh, more detail on professional organizations. Yep. Um, so I see download that. Mark, Mark commented here. I see one Mark commented saying many of the items in the resource list are coming up with an error. Defender, Microsoft Defender for O365 encountered an error. So might want to have to pull that PDF offline. Um, the hyperlinks that are Im embedded in there should should be should work. Not sure why right. we're seeing that. Yeah, Defender is blocking the. <laughs> we'll we'll, yeah, we'll figure that one out. Yeah, probably it happens when you paste a URL into PowerPoint when it's yeah. from Office three sixty five. Yep, we I'm might sure we might have to adjust. It. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we missed it. Um, Okay, um, Anna says we'll resend the resource slide as a follow-up email. Perfect, so yes. Apologies about that. We did not think to check it from a PC outside of our organization. Yeah. yeah. Um, great, so let's um, let's wrap it up. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, we'll follow up with an email with the revised resources slide and um, hope to see you again on a, another Redmond Magazine um, webcast soon. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Bill and Luke, for being with us today and sharing your expertise. We truly appreciate it. And I just wanted to echo Gil and Luke's words about the resources. You will receive a link tomorrow with the replay of the event as well as links to all the resources. Um, but other than that, thank you everyone for attending today's webcast, which was sponsored by St. Paris and presented by RevinMike.com. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.